The following is distributed by the Berean Call. Welcome to Apostasy Update. Um, this is the third program in our series addressing what the Bible has to say prophetically about the last days prior to the return of Jesus Christ. Now, the term used to describe those events is eschatology, and in general, it has to do with the final events of history. My partner in discussing what the Bible declares will take place in the last days is Carl, Carl Tykrib. He's the author of Game of Gods, The Temple of Man in the Age of Reenchantment. Carl, welcome back. Hey, thank you, Tom. You know, Carl, before we pick up where we left off last week, I have a question for you. Why should we be concerned about the last days, especially the rise of the religion in the, the kingdom of the Antichrist? I'm thinking especially about those like me who believe in the rapture of the church, which according to scripture, we will be removed from the earth before the great tribulation and the establishment of the kingdom of the Antichrist. So what do you say? Well, well, first of all, the Bible, the Bible itself is loaded with prophecy. The, the, the spirit of, of, of the Bible is a prophetic book. It's a book that through the Old Testament prophesies the first coming of Christ, looking forward to the Messiah as he comes, and then, as we see in the New Testament, that there is again a forward-looking to Christ returning again, and this time returning as, as that king, returning as that, as that lion, not coming first as the lamb, as he did, but now, we come, uh, now coming back as that, as that uh, declared king of kings, lord of lords. Mm -hmm. And so, first of all, for us as believers, we should be excited about that. We should be excited about the fact that that Scripture prophesies and Scripture foretells what will be coming, what is what will take place, and and in all of this, it points to Jesus Christ. It points to Him first. That's really important. It's not necessarily about uh, world systems or about uh, you know even the Antichrist per se. All that's a part of it, but even in that, when we take a look. And what scripture says, it still points to Jesus Christ, which is one of the exciting aspects of doing this kind of work, Tom, because we see what the world is doing. We see prophetically what the Bible says. We recognize that from, from the fall, from Genesis until Revelation, that there is a, a tension, a drama that's unfolding. Mm -hmm. And that drama is between Christ and his declared salvation, or man, and his declared deity and, uh, and ascension. Which is it? Which do we follow? And so as we study, as we study the God's Word, as we study uh, eschatology, it should excite us about his coming return. Mm -hmm. It also should do something else besides excite us about his return. Uh, it, it should cause us to recognize the times we live in, the serious nature of the times that we live in, and not just simply now, but how it has progressed throughout the ages. That there's a continuity. You can see, you can see Scripture unfold as it describes the human condition of our transgression against God, and as we see it coming to its its final drama between the system of Antichrist, the system of man versus Jesus himself. And so it does this. It impels us to want to understand Scripture more. And it should impel us to see where we stand today, because we're part of that unfolding story. Mm -hmm. And, and every, every person alive right now, uh, we are situated in that timeline that God has put out. And that's exciting. Yeah. We're, here for, we're here for a reason. We're here for mm -hmm. a very specific time. And, uh, and that's an exciting proposition. You know, the, the thing that I keep falling back to is um, if there's a, a, a greater uh, support 
uh, if there's a greater apologetic for the the Bible being God's word, God's communication to mankind, I don't know what else is. I mean, there are right. things, yes, but but that to me is amazing because you can point to the word of God and say, hey, look, uh, the word of God prophesied that this would take place. Did it take place? Well, let's check it out historically and so on. And then in terms of, of a witness, yeah, we're not going to be here, but whatever we've left behind, <laughs> okay, uh, whatever, um, possibly even, you know, what we're doing right here. Uh, when we're taken out, we, we've already been ministering to people. We've been uh, talking about this. Uh, because what, what do we say to them? We say, hey, look, here's what the Bible says. Check it out. Is any of that happening today? Are, are you seeing any of that? You, what do you think? You think that's by chance? You know, and uh, so... It's, it is exciting, and, and it is something, you see, I sometimes, you know, being a former, former Catholic, uh, sometimes I, I have these guilt trips, because <laughs> <Okay? laughs> whether you're Jewish or Catholic, you know, you're going to major in guilt, at least, sorry, folks, if I've offended anybody out there, but that was the reality for me, okay, so um, I used to think, what's the point? You know, we're not going to be here. Why should we make a big issue of this? Why should we make a big deal of it? Talk about Mr. Dodo, you know, and then uh, I don't know how to happened, but I got turned around. I say, wait a minute, hold on. There's, there's evangelizing, there's witnessing to people, there's pointing to the word of God that it's true and it can prove the truth of what it says, uh, you know. And uh, so again, folks, that's a major part of what we're doing, why we're doing what we're doing. Yes, yeah. and you know something? You don't have to be a, an expert in, in Bible prophecy to be excited by it. I actually, and this, is, this is, might sound uh, uh, interesting for some people or maybe even concerning. I'm, I don't consider myself an expert in Bible prophecy. I, I deal on worldview trends that are unfolding right now, but even those worldview trends that are unfolding in its past and in its current form point somewhere. Right. And they point, they point to the fact that we are living in an age when you see man's system at war with God's system. And even that points to the fact that, yes, we have a hope, and the hope is Jesus Christ. Right. And uh, which we're going to get into big time, not only in this program, but in the programs that we do together, uh, the Lord willing, down the line. Uh, we're going to keep underscoring that, confirming these things uh, and pointing to how this is pointing in a, in a direction that we need to be aware of. Um, you know, if folks, if you've been following and enjoying the series and would like to, to dig deeper into the information that we can only provide really at a surface level through these very long 40 minutes per se, uh, you can check out the books that we're using. You know, we mentioned Carl's book, Game of Gods. There's America, the Sorcerer's New Apprentice, the rise of New Age shamanism, which I had the privilege of working on with Dave Hunt, and Samuel Andrews' book, Christianity and Anti-Christianity in Their Final Conflict, and most importantly, the Bible, God's Word. So we have all of these available at the Bring Call. So thus far in the series, we've discussed the different perspectives of why the world is so messed up. Now, recounting the biblical perspective, which we've mentioned and which we have faith in, is not complex. God, who created everything that is made, is infinite. He exists outside his creation, which he created in perfection. Then sin entered what God had made through the disobedience of Adam and Eve. And sin affected all of creation and brought about death, physical and spiritual. And although the physical world has suffered the consequences of mankind's sin, what sin has produced among humans accounts for every form of wickedness and evil doing imaginable in this world. And mankind has been reaping that sinful mess for thousands of years. That's the problem. Now, Carl, any additional comments on the effects on humanity? 
yet God has the solution. What does God's, well, speak to either one. What God has, what God's word has to say about his solution, which the Bible calls the good news. The, the, the solution, the solution rests on him and not on ourselves. And that, that is the great chasm between man and God. Uh, the, the solution rests on the finished work of Jesus Christ. It isn't on something you've done. It's not something on, uh, that I have done. It's not an issue of our works, but it's an issue of God's grace. And, and here's what I see, Tom, when I go to different uh, events uh, as a researcher, when I go to the Parliament of World Religions, or when I've gone to a global governance events, uh, I, this is the thing, this is the core that I see coming through over and over again. They are looking for a salvation plan. In fact, the Parliament of, of World Religions in 2018, the, the closing ceremonies, one of the executives of the Parliament made it very clear, and he used this word on a number of occasions in his closing, in his closing speech, that we are engaging in the salvation of the world. And by saving the world, we save ourselves. Tom, it's a salvation alternative. That is what the world is doing. Sometimes you look at the, at the type of work that, you, that, that Dave and yourself did in your book, America, The Sorcerer's New Apprentice, or I've been reading through Andrew's book, uh, Christianity and Anti-Christianity, or even my own book, Game of Gods. And there's a lot of complexity there. There's a lot of, uh, of moving parts. But the bottom line in all three books, and, and what Scripture itself points to, is that it's really quite simple. It's very simple. Salvation is either in God through Jesus Christ or in some other man-made structure or some other man-made endeavor. Which one are you going to choose? The problem can't fix itself. You're going to choose man's system. Good luck with that. Or you choose the one who is outside of time, space, and matter, the one who created itself. Which one do you choose? And, and so what, we, and what I have to tell people is, look, even in the issue of global governance, I have an entire chapter on, on world order uh, because I've attended UN events. I've attended global governance events. Over and over again, Tom, the message is we are the last hope for the world. The United Nations is mankind's last best hope or some system of world order is man's hope. So there's always, whether it's implied or explicit, this question, God system or man system, Jesus Christ or humanity saving itself, which is it? Again, it plays out in, a, in, in all kinds of nuances, uh, incredibly complex nuances. I mean, all three of the books we we're describing and talking about demonstrate some of those nuances, but there's, there's a simplicity to it. And it's really an issue of choice. Who do you trust, God or man? You know, and folks, what, what we're trying to do here, as I mentioned, <laughs> I'm not the brightest star in the sky. I, I admit that. But, but I do have a kind of a, a, a simple mind that likes, if, there, if it's available, there are many things that are very, very complex and very profound. But what we're trying to do with all of this is simplify it as best we can. And it can be, you know, this isn't something that's, oh, well, it's way too complex. No, it's not. Uh, and one of the things that I want to do, you know, in the, in our past programs, we talked about materialistic science. Well, folks, if you haven't gone through the, the other programs, it, basically it's this, it's that everything, there's nothing that exists outside of matter. Okay, there's no spirit, there's no non-physical reality, according to that view. It's a view that's been around for a long time, but it's losing favor because <laughs> it doesn't work. But, but the point I'm making is that how would they, what would be their world solution? Well, all problems are going to be, revolved, be resolved through science. That is, a science that denies the existence of anything non-physical, which, of course, would exclude the God of the Bible. Certainly, some problems have been resolved through science, which we're thankful for, right? Mm -hmm. But all problems, 
And many of the ones that seem to be fixed have produced additional problems. I had a serious infection some time ago, Carl, and uh, I had to take a, a very powerful antibiotic. Uh, it was helpful, but the potential list of side effects read like the index from the little shop of horrors. I mean, it was frightening. Well, after, you know, it worked, the antibiotic worked, there were no side effects, but I'll tell you what, I tripled up on probiotics right after that. I just went after it. So yes, we're not denying the value of science, if it's true science. But we know that science has moved quickly from what we're talking about, this idea that nothing exists outside matter, physical matter, uh, to a wishfulness, to a mysticism, which we're going to get into. But there are other issues related to materialistic science that one is that it denies the purpose for mankind as well as an afterlife. You know, it's bound to it's bound to this earth. You're born, you die, that's it. Now, Carl, you mentioned last week, and I'd like you to repeat this because it's really important, about your Christian friend who talked to a science professor who was a scientific materialist, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and what did he say to him? Well, you know, it was an interesting conversation. Now, my friend, my Christian friend, is, is part of our, our our weekly Bible study group, and he was going to university uh, for his degree in education. And he had to take a, a course on, on philosophy, and it was specifically mathematical philosophy, mm -hmm. because my friend is, his specialty is mathematics. And going into the education system, he'll be going in as a math teacher. But his math, te his math uh, professor, his, his mathematics philosophy professor, was very, very clear that he was a naturalist, a materialist, that uh, th there is nothing else outside of the material universe. And so my friend had many conversations with him. And, and one of the things that came up in the conversation was this, as a materialist, and the professor admitted this. This is important, Tom. The professor admitted this. As a materialist, he has no ultimate hope. There is no hope. More than that, he explained it very in very clear language that he has to, on a daily basis, lie to himself. He has to live in a purposeful illusion of hope, a purposeful illusion that there's some meaning or purpose to all of this, because in his materialist worldview, he knows, being honest to it, he knows that there is no purpose. There is no ultimate meaning. There is no hope. And my friend was, he was flabbergasted by this because he's like, that's horrible. That's horrible. How can you live like that? Uh, and 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 it, it brought about some really interesting conversations between the two of them because they had also developed a friendship. Uh, but it really was a question of my friend as a Christian having hope, hope in Jesus Christ, hope because he is made, and as Genesis 1 tells us, he is made in the image of God, that he is God's reflection on earth. He is supposed to be God's representative on earth, that there is therefore value there is purpose, there is meaning, there is, there is, is, is a beautiful element to that. Or you live with, I'm just an accident in an accidental universe. Sure, there's order to the universe. We see all kinds of things coming together, but ultimately there's no meaning, there's no purpose, there's no destiny, there's no hope. Mm -hmm. I have to lie to myself. How tragic is that, Tom? How tragic? Yeah, it <clears throat> it's incredibly tragic. And you, you pointed out, I think you used the term that it, it left him, not him because he was a believer, but it leaves people with a vacuum of despair and dis despondency. Right. Now, it, the interesting thing about that, and I don't want to get ahead of ourselves because we're going to talk about the, the New Age movement. I mean, we're really talking about it now, but we're, we're not getting into it directly. But that emptiness, I believe, opened the door for the New Age movement, which was a westernized version of Eastern mysticism. 
Well, why is that? Because they recognized, I mean, look, there, we've talked about two aspects of materialism. One is, hey, all the goodies, you know, we've got everything, everything we need, along with the, the philosophical viewpoint. But again, that leads to emptiness, you know, nothing within the soul, you know, there's nothing it can relate to. And I just think that blew open the doors for uh, the New Age movement, which basically is a westernized uh, revamp of Hinduism, of Eastern mysticism. Oh, it absolutely did. It blew open the doors first for, for and they, they came together, postmodernism and the New Age movement. The two of them go hand in hand. They walk together. Postmodernism ultimately saying, oh, we have our questions and no answers. There really is no meaning. But we are in a search for some type of meaning. We're looking for something. And the New Age movement saying, we, we have an answer. There is an answer. And, and follow this path, the Eastern path. And what's interesting is the New Age movement is both a, it's a combination of the Eastern path, and it's also a combination of the materialist psychology, the path of human potentiality. Right. And the two come together, and that's, and really they came together in the 1960s in one place, and we'll probably get into this down the road in some detail. Mm -hmm. But at, in, at the Esalon Institute, that is with human potential and new spirituality came together and formed in its essence the new age movement but what's interesting is even when when we were in the height of modernity uh it, let, let's say even the 1800s there was a recognition that there is this there, there still is a a religious impulse a spiritual not yet let's say a spiritual but a religious philosophical impulse and it was so hard for even materialists of the day to say all there is is materials. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, for most of your of, of your audience, maybe the, uh, the 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 two individuals, two philosophers, Saint Simon and August Comte, don't maybe mean too much. Saint Simon and August Comte are kind of the forefathers of socialism. Uh, Saint Simon was the teacher. August Comte was the student. Saint Simon, in the early eighteen hundreds, um, he said, "Look." Look, what we need is a new system. We need a system where, where men of industry, men of science, men of business order civilization. And we have to end dogma. We have to end theology. We have to, we have to replace all this with something more, with something that is, is what we would call secular. But he couldn't let that go. In an essay that he entitled New Christianity, he described this new system within the context of being a new form of Christianity. Again, it was devoid of dogma, devoid of theology, devoid of scripture. Um, let me just read for you what he said, because this strikes at the heart of, here we go, strikes at the heart of this, of this uh, humanist quest, and yet at the same time saying, Ah, there's still something more because we're looking for something uh, somehow religious. So this is what he wrote. And, and this is from his book, uh, Social Organization, the Science of Man and Other Writings. The rejuvenated religion. Remember, he's a secularist. He's a materialist. The rejuvenated religion is called upon to organize all peoples in a state of perpetual peace by, uh, by allying them all against the nation which tries to gain its own advantage at the expense of the good of the whole human race. It is called upon to link together the scientists, artists, and industrialists, and to make them the managing directors of the human race, as well as of the particular interests of each individual people. It is called upon to put the arts, experimental sciences, and industry in the front rank of sacred studies. Finally, New Christianity is called upon to pronounce anathema, upon theology, and to get them as unholy any doctrine, trying to teach men that there is any other way of obtaining eternal life except that of working with all their might for the improvement of the conditions of life of their fellow man. Whoa! Yeah. Wow. And so he went on, uh, uh, St. Simon went on to talk about how, how dangerous Bible study was. 
because what would what what would would uh, Bible study do? This is how he 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 puts it. The study of the Bible draws attention to political motives contrary to the public welfare. It prevents the Protestants from working for a political system in which common interests will be managed by the ablest men in science, art, and industry. And so St. Simon recognized, I've got a humanist materialist system, but he still couches it within a religious construct. And then his student, August Kant, develops a system of philosophy called positivism, which says there is no truth, no truth, no knowledge outside of what can be positively experienced and encountered through science. And so positivism formed a very strong philosophical foundation for materialism. But August Comte understood that this too has almost a religious underpinning. And so he created what he called the religion of humanity, where they would have worship services for humanity. Uh, they would even do group studies, like personal group encounters to help generate good social feelings for humanity. Tom, we can't escape this, can we? Here's the two individuals who form the, the heartbeat of materialist socialism, and yet they recognize that within it is still yeah. this, this religious, religious heartbeat. Carl, that is that's so critical, so important. And folks, did you hear that? The 1800s, okay? <laughs> you, could have been, you could have been on you know, a news broadcast and promoting that today, and people, oh yeah, okay, we, we see it, we understand it, we're in it. The other irony, great irony, I think here, now this may show my ignorance, but you know, uh, why did his parents name him Saint Simon? I mean, he wasn't a canonized saint, was he? <laughs> no, no, he wasn't. <laughs> oh, brother. But, you know, but, but he, when, when we point these things out and we start laughing, it's primarily about the absurdity of, of, of what we're seeing there. But in, in any way, we, we, it, it grieves us. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost like you're forced to laugh because you don't want to cry. Well, and you said something even before the broadcast started, as we were personally talking before the camera was rolling, that we have to be able to laugh. If we, if we can't laugh a little bit, oh, Tom, we're in trouble. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, the, the other thing that, uh, that I, want to, I want to get back to, and this was an important point that you made, but I want to deal with and end the whole uh, scientific materialism, get that out of the way, because we know it didn't work for them. But there are some other aspects to it that need to be addressed as well. And that's naturalism and evolution. Now, what's the connection between them and the materialistic science that we've been talking about? How, how are they related, Carl? Well, m materialism and evolution come together in, in, the, in that mm -hmm. evolution forms, let's, let's call it the framework by which we can now declare materialism as the highest ideal. Not, not, we don't need God. We don't need God. We see, we've done away with the supernatural. If we accept evolution and its premise, then we have done away with the supernatural. We, have now, we now have a foundation upon which to build our materialist worldview because there is nothing outside of the natural world. There's nothing outside of the created the created uh, 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 order. And, and, and evolution is fundamental. If we didn't have an evolutionary point of view, materialism probably would never have, uh, have had the success it did in our academic world, in our universities. Mm -hmm. It probably never would have had that, that drive behind it. But evolution, evolution becomes that, that engine or that foundation that allows it to, to, to stand firm and then project itself. Evolution is very important. And I know, I know Tommy, you, you folks have done, have done programming, written articles, published uh, on the issue of evolution. You've had speakers who dealt with the issue of evolution. But those two things are, are, are tied together and people need to recognize that evolution produces a philosophical worldview. And it's a worldview that says God doesn't exist. All right. we have is the material. So it justifies it. 
Right. It justifies and, it. And as you've described and we talked about, um, where's it going? What is it proven? Well, give me some facts. Give me some truth related to evolution. Right. No, it's not there. So where, where are they going to go from this? And, and as I mentioned before, I want to address this and get this. I want to throw this out of the park because there's nothing that you can say about this, folks. Um, you know, two of us didn't just come off the street and we're, you know, we're making this up. You know, this is my studies along with Dave Hunt, uh, Carl, and, uh, and, and many others that we've had the blessing to, uh, to talk to, to interact with, and so on. So where, where are they going to go? If scientific materialism is dead, they still, as you've described, they still have to make this work. Because, again, we said this last week, I think I said it, you've got God or self. Right. If you reject God, you're left with self. So self has to make it work. And they're going to reach for anything they can to continue the program because they reject the living God of the Bible. Okay. Once that rejection is made, they're left on their own. So what can they throw into this? And it's going to be mysticism. Now, so they have to turn to mysticism. But let me give you some definitions of mysticism. And I pulled these out. This is not, um, you know, my favorite dictionary of all time is the, uh, you know, the, the Webster Dictionary of, what is it, 1828, <laughs> in which he got most of his definition from the Bible, okay? Um, but no, I'm, I didn't go to that. I went to the uh, Oxford Dictionary of today. Now, here's what it says about that. Well, mysticism is a belief that union with or absorption into deity or the absolute or the spiritual apprehension of knowledge inaccessible to the intellect may be attained through contemplation and self-surrender. And before we get on that part, here's the other definition that it gives. Again, folks, the Oxford Dictionary, Modern Dictionary. It says, Mysticism is a belief characterized by self-delusion or dreamy confusion of thought, especially when based on the assumption of occult qualities or mysterious agencies. <laughs> Carl, although the second definition may sound a bit condescending, well, what else could you say? Those are indeed some of the characteristics of mysticism, which we're going to be explaining throughout the series. As the first definition indicates, it involves, quote, apprehension of knowledge inaccessible to the intellect. That's another way of saying it doesn't take place through normal consciousness, but rather through an altered state of consciousness. For example, psychedelic drug trips through the use of LSD or psilocybin or marijuana often induce an altered state of consciousness but they also occur through non-drug methods such as yoga meditation, sensory deprivation, trances, hyper-breathing techniques, even ritualistic dance practices and more. So Carl, what can you add to, you know, again, we're, we're gonna get into this, folks, keep your seatbelts on, because this is what we're going, well, this is where we're going with this. So what are your thoughts about mysticism? I, I would like to add one more thing to this. One, sure. one more, one more aspect to the definitions. It's a feeling. There's an emotion to it. There is a a sense that you have now experienced something that's beyond the ordinary. There is a, a definite feeling that comes alongside of that mystical experience. What's interesting is even August Comte, going back to to his materialist positivist worldview. He understood that order and positivism was something that men could understand. And remember, this is like the early 1800s, and he was describing right. this before Darwin, before Darwin's theory even uh, emerged. Uh, he understood that, that men understood order because we build, we construct. But what we also needed was, in his term, the, the, the feminine side or the female side, and that was the emotion, the feeling. And so 
he was looking for for both a materialist worldview, a materialist uh, kind of an underpinning for everything, but he recognized at the same time there has to be this sense of a connection. There has to be this sense or, or this feeling that you are now part of something bigger than yourself. And I think mysticism uh, it embodies that. It's not just simply you've gone into an altered state of consciousness. You have, absolutely. But what has that altered state of consciousness done? It has said, oh, I have now experienced, I have felt something that's beyond the ordinary. This becomes my basis for reality. You know, uh, Carl, there are so many aspects, which I mentioned, folks, we're, we're going to be dealing with later. But look, a chief characteristic of mysticism is its subjective aspect. It entails one's personal thoughts, emotions, experiences, intuitions, and particularly feelings, as you, as you just said, Carl. So mysticism refrains from any objective evaluation or requirement. That's why the shift from scientific materialism, which has no answers, to now, well, let's, uh, let's get away from the objective aspects, okay? Which some people won't ever do, but many people will because it supplies answers that their other views couldn't come up with. Right. So that's what we're dealing with. And Carl, we're, we're out of time for this one. I think we actually went over a bit, but that's okay. Um, so I want to come back to this, but uh, folks, we're going to take a slight break in what we're dealing with, but it's only slight because what I'd like to do, the Lord willing, for the next couple, into Samuel Andrews' book, Christianity and Anti-Christianity and Their Final Conflict, because I don't want... Uh, you know, our, our viewers to lose sight of the fact where this is going. Right. Here's the track. Here's the rail that it's on. And, uh, you know, Andrew's book, the 1800s, 1880, 120 years ago. Uh, well, 1900, my math's a little bit there, but nevertheless, 120 years ago. Uh, and uh, it's, it's important. It's an important book. And uh, so we'll, we'll deal with that next week, maybe for a couple of weeks. But this is all on track. This is all heading the direction which it, we had hoped for when we decided to put this together. Right, Carl? Absolutely. This is exciting. It's, it's good okay. to see where it's going to go. So thanks, brother, for your input. And God bless you. And look forward to next week. All right. We'll talk to you then, Tom.